The Quran is borrowed from both Jewish and Christian myths. The doings and sayings of Moses and Abraham and Jesus, being so ill-founded and so inconsistent, as well as so often immoral, one must proceed in the same spirit of inquiry to what many believe is the last revelation, that of the Prophet Muhammad and his Quran or recitation. Here again, the angel or archangel Gabriel is found at work, dictating surahs or verses to a person of little or no learning. Here again are stories of a Noah-like flood and injunctions against idol worship. Here again the Jews are the first recipients of the message and the first both to hear it and to discard it. And here again there is a vast commentary of doubtful anecdote about the actual doings and sayings of the Prophet, this time known as the Hadith. Islam is at once the most and the least interesting of the world's monotheisms. It builds upon its primitive Jewish and Christian predecessors, selecting a chunk here and a shard there, and thus if these fall, it partly falls also. Its founding narrative likewise takes place within an astonishingly small compass and relates facts about extremely tedious local quarrels. None of the original documents, such as they are, can be contrasted with any Hebrew or Greek or Latin texts. Almost all of the tradition is oral, and all of it is in Arabic. Indeed, many authorities agree that the Quran is only intelligible in that tongue, which is itself subject to innumerable idiomatic and regional inflections. This would leave us on the face of it with the absurd and potentially dangerous conclusion that God was a monoglot. Before me is a book, Introducing Muhammad, written by two extremely unctuous British Muslims, who are hoping to present a friendly version of Islam to the West. Ingratiating and selective as their text may be, they insist that, as the literal word of God, the Quran is the Quran, only in the original revealed text. A translation can never be the Quran. That inimitable symphony, the very sound of which moves men and women to tears. A translation can only be an attempt to give the barest suggestion of the meaning of words contained in the Quran. This is why all Muslims, whatever their mother tongue, always recite the Quran in its original Arabic. The authors go on to make some highly disobliging observations about the Penguin translation by N. J. Dawood, which makes me glad that I have always employed the Pict Hall version, but no likely to be convinced that if I wish to become a convert, I must master another language. In my own country of birth, I am sadly aware that there is a beautiful poetic tradition unavailable to me because I will never know the marvellous tongue called Gaelic. Even if God is or was an Arab, an unsafe assumption, how could he expect to reveal himself by way of an illiterate person who in turn could not possibly hope to pass on the unaltered, let alone unalterable, words? The point may seem minor, but it is not. To Muslims, the enunciation of the divine to a person of extreme unlettered simplicity has something of the same value as the humble vessel of the Virgin Mary has to Christians. It also possesses the same useful merit of being entirely unverifiable and unfalsifiable. Since Mary must be presumed to have spoken Aramaic and Muhammad Arabic, it can, I suppose, be granted that God is in fact multilingual and can speak any language he chooses. He opted in both cases to use the Archangel Gabriel as the intermediate deliverer of his message. However, the impressive fact remains that all religions have staunchly resisted any attempt to translate their sacred texts into languages understanded of the people, as the Cranmer Prayer Book phrases it. There would have been no Protestant Reformation if it were not for the long struggle to have the Bible rendered into the Vulgate and the priestly monopoly therefore broken. Devout men like Wycliffe, Coverdale, and Tyndale were burned alive for even attempting early translations. The Catholic Church has never recovered from its abandonment of the mystifying Latin ritual, and the Protestant mainstream has suffered hugely from rendering its own Bibles into more everyday speech. Some mystical Jewish sects still insist on Hebrew and play Kabbalistic word games even with the spaces between letters, but among most Jews too, the supposedly unchangeable rituals of antiquity have been abandoned. The spell of the clerical class has been broken. Only in Islam has there been no reformation, and to this day, any vernacular version of the Quran must still be printed with an Arabic parallel text. This ought to arouse suspicion, even in the slowest mind. Later Muslim conquests, impressive in their speed and scope and decisiveness, have lent point to the idea that these Arabic incantations must have had something to them. 
But if you allow this cheap earthly victory as a proof, you allow the same to Joshua's blood-soaked tribesmen, or to the Christian crusaders and conquistadors. There is a further objection. All religions take care to silence, or to execute those who question them. And I choose to regard this recurrent tendency as a sign of their weakness, rather than their strength. It has, however, been some time since Judaism and Christianity resorted openly to torture and censorship. Not only did Islam begin by condemning all doubters to eternal fire, but it still claims the right to do so in almost all of its dominions, and still preaches that these dominions can and must be extended by war. There has never been an attempt in any age to challenge or even investigate the claims of Islam that has not been met with extremely harsh and swift repression. Provisionally, then, one is entitled to conclude that the apparent unity and confidence of the faith is a mask for a very deep and probably justifiable insecurity. That there are, and always have been, sanguinary feuds between different schools of Islam, resulting in strictly inter-Muslim accusations of heresy and profanity, and in terrible acts of violence, naturally goes without saying. I have tried my best with this religion, which is as foreign to me as it is to the many millions who will always doubt that God entrusted a non-reader, through an intermediary, with the demanding call to read. As I said, I long ago acquired a copy of the Marmaduke Pictal translation of the Quran, which has been certified by senior sources in the ulema, or Islamic religious authority, to be the nearest to an approximate rendition into English. I have been to innumerable gatherings, from Friday prayers in Tehran, to mosques in Damascus and Jerusalem and Doha and Istanbul and Washington, D.C., and I can attest that the recitation in Arabic does indeed have the apparent power to create bliss and also rage among those who hear it. I have also attended prayers in Malaysia and Indonesia and Bosnia, where there is resentment among non-Arabic-speaking Muslims at the privilege granted to Arabs and to Arabic and to Arab movements and regimes in a religion that purports to be universal. I have in my own home received Sayyid Hussein Khomeini, grandson of the Ayatollah and a cleric from the holy city of Qum, and carefully handed him my own copy of the Quran. He kissed it, discussed it at length and with reverence, and for my instruction wrote in the back flap the verses which he thought had disproved his grandfather's claim to clerical authority in this world, as well as overthrown his grandfather's claim to take the life of Salman Rushdie. Who am I to adjudicate in such a dispute? However, the idea that the identical text can yield different commandments to different people is quite familiar to me for other reasons. There's no need to overstate the difficulty of understanding Islam's alleged profundities. If one comprehends the fallacies of any revealed religion, one comprehends them all. I have only once in 25 years of often heated arguments in Washington, D.C., been threatened with actual violence. This was when I was at dinner with some staffers and supporters of the Clinton White House. One of those present, a then well-known Democratic pollster and fundraiser, questioned me about my own most recent trip to the Middle East. He wanted my opinion as to why the Muslims were so all-fired goddamn fundamentalist. I ran through my repertoire of explanations, adding that it was often forgotten that Islam was a relatively young faith and still in the heat of its self-confidence. Not for Muslims the crisis of self-doubt that had overtaken Western Christianity. I added that, for example, while there was little or no evidence for the life of Jesus, the figure of the Prophet Muhammad was by contrast a person in ascertainable history. The man changed color faster than anyone I've ever seen. After shrieking that Jesus Christ had meant more to more people than I could ever imagine, and that I was disgusting beyond words for speaking so casually, he drew back his foot and aimed a kick which only his decency, conceivably his Christianity, prevented him from landing on my shin. He then ordered his wife to join him in leaving. I now feel that I owe him an apology, or at least half of one. Although we do know that a person named Muhammad almost certainly existed within a fairly small bracket of time and space, we have the same problem as we do in all the precedent cases. The accounts that relate his deeds and words were assembled many years later and are hopelessly corrupted into incoherence by self-interest, rumor, and illiteracy. The tale is familiar enough, even if it is new to you. Some Meccans of the 7th century followed an Abrahamic tradition and even believed that their temple, the Kaaba, had been built by Abraham. The temple itself, most of its original furnishings having been destroyed by later fundamentalists, notably the Wahhabis, is said to have become depraved by idolatry. Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, became one of those Hunafa, who turned away to seek solace elsewhere. Retiring to a desert cave on Mount Hira for the month of heat, or Ramadan, he was, asleep or in a trance, I'm quoting Pictol's commentary, 
when he heard a voice commanding him to read. He replied twice that he was unable to read, and was thrice commanded to do so. Eventually asking what he should read, he was further commanded in the name of a Lord who created man from a clot of blood. After the angel Gabriel, who so identified himself, had told Muhammad that he was to be Allah's messenger and had departed, Muhammad confided in his wife, Khadija. On their return to Mecca, she took him to meet her cousin, an elderly man named Waraka ibn Nufal, who knew the scriptures of the Jews and Christians. This whiskered veteran declared that the divine envoy who once visited Moses had come again to Mount Hira. From then on, Muhammad adopted the modest title of Slave of Allah, the latter word being simply the Arabic for God. The only people who at first took the smallest interest in Muhammad's claim were the greedy guardians of the temple at Mecca, who saw it as a threat to their pilgrimage business, and the studious Jews of Yathrib, a town 200 miles distant, who had been for some time proclaiming the advent of the Messiah. The first group became more threatening, and the second more friendly, as a result of which Muhammad made the journey, or Hajira, to Yathrib, which is now known as Medina. The date of the flight counts as the inauguration of the Muslim era. But as with the arrival of the Nazarene in Jewish Palestine, which began with so many cheerful heavenly auguries, this was all to end very badly, with the realization on the part of the Arabian Jews that they were faced with yet another disappointment, if not indeed another imposter. According to Karen Armstrong, one of the most sympathetic, not to say apologetic, analysts of Islam, the Arabs of the time had a wounded feeling that they had been left out of history. God had appeared to Christians and Jews, but he had sent the Arabs no prophet and no scripture in their own language. Thus, though she does not put it this way, the time for someone to have a local revelation was long overdue, and once having had it, Muhammad was not inclined to let it be criticized as second-hand by adherents of older faiths. The record of his 7th century career, like the books of the Old Testament, swiftly becomes an account of vicious quarrels between a few hundred or sometimes a few thousand unlearned villagers and townspeople, in which the finger of God was supposed to settle and determine the outcome of parochial disputes. As with the primeval bloodlettings of the Sinai and Canaan, which are likewise unattested by any independent evidence, millions of people have been held hostage ever since by the supposedly providential character of these ugly squabbles. There is some question as to whether Islam is a separate religion at all. It initially fulfilled a need among Arabs for a distinctive or special creed, and is forever identified with their language and their impressive later conquests, which, while not as striking as those of the young Alexander of Macedonia, certainly conveyed an idea of being backed by a divine will, until they petered out at the fringes of the Balkans and the Mediterranean. But Islam, when examined, is not much more than a rather obvious and ill-arranged set of plagiarisms, helping itself from earlier books and traditions as occasion appeared to require. Thus, far from being born in the clear light of history, as Ernest Renan so generously phrased it, Islam in its origins is just as shady and approximate as those from which it took its borrowings. It makes immense claims for itself, invokes prostrate submission or surrender as a maxim to its adherents, and demands deference and respect from non-believers into the bargain. There is nothing, absolutely nothing, in its teachings that can even begin to justify such arrogance and presumption. The Prophet died in the year 632 of our own approximate calendar. The first account of his life was set down a full 120 years later by Ibn Ishaq, whose original was lost and can only be consulted through its reworked form, authored by Ibn Hisham, who died in 834. Adding to this hearsay and obscurity, there is no agreed-upon account of how the Prophet's followers assembled the Quran, or of how his various sayings, some of them written down by secretaries, became codified. And this familiar problem is further complicated, even more than in the Christian case, by the matter of succession. Unlike Jesus, who apparently undertook to return to earth very soon, and who, Pache, the absurd Dan Brown, left no known descendants, Muhammad was a general and a politician, and though unlike Alexander of Macedonia, a prolific father, left no instruction as to who was to take up his mantle. Quarrels over the leadership began almost as soon as he died, and so Islam had its first major schism between the Sunni and the Shia before it had even established itself as a system. We need take no side in the schism, except to point out that one at least of the schools of interpretation must be quite mistaken. And the initial identification of Islam with an earthly caliphate made up of disputatious contenders for the said mantle marked it from the very beginning as man-made. It is said by some Muslim authorities that during the first caliphate of Abu Bakr, immediately after Muhammad's death, concern arose that his orally transmitted words might be forgotten. So many Muslim soldiers had been killed in battle that the number who had the Quran safely lodged in their memories had become alarmingly small. It was therefore decided to assemble every living witness together with pieces of paper, stones, palm leaves, shoulder blades, 
ribs and bits of leather on which sayings had been scribbled and give them to Zaid ibn Tabid, one of the Prophet's former secretaries, for an authoritative collation. Once this had been done, the believers had something like an authorized version. If true, this would date the Quran to a time fairly close to Muhammad's own life, but we swiftly discover that there is no certainty or agreement about the truth of the story. Some say that it was Ali, the fourth and not the first caliph, and the founder of Shiism, who had the idea. Many others, the Sunni majority, assert that it was Caliph Uthman, who reigned from 644 to 656, who made the finalized decision. Told by one of his generals that soldiers from different provinces were fighting over discrepant accounts of the Quran, Uthman ordered Zayib ibn Tabit to bring together the various texts, unify them, and have them transcribed into one. When this task was complete, Uthman ordered standard copies to be sent to Kufa, Basra, Damascus, and elsewhere, with a master copy retained in Medina. Uthman thus played the canonical role that had been taken in the standardization and purging and censorship of the Christian Bible by Irenaeus and by Bishop Athanasius of Alexandria. The role was called, and some texts were declared sacred and inerrant, while others became apocryphal. Outdoing Athanasius, Uthman ordered that all earlier and rival editions be destroyed. Even supposing this version of events to be correct, which would mean that no chance existed for scholars ever to determine or even dispute what really happened in Muhammad's time, Uthman's attempt to abolish disagreement was a vain one. The written Arabic language has two features that make it difficult for an outsider to learn. It uses dots to distinguish consonants like B and T, and in its original form it had no sign or symbol for short vowels, which could be rendered by various dashes or comma-type marks. Vastly different readings, even of Uthman's version, were enabled by these variations. Arabic script itself was not standardized until the later part of the ninth century, and in the meantime, the undotted and oddly vowelled Quran was generating wildly different explanations of itself, as it still does. This might not matter in the case of the Iliad, but remember that we are supposed to be talking about the unalterable and final word of God. There is obviously a connection between the sheer feebleness of this claim and the absolutely fanatical certainty with which it is advanced. To take one instance that can hardly be called negligible, the Arabic words written on the outside of the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem are different from any version that appears in the Quran. The situation is even more shaky and deplorable when we come to the Hadith or that vast orally generated secondary literature which supposedly conveys the sayings and actions of Muhammad, the tale of the Quran's compilation, and the sayings of the companions of the Prophet. Each Hadith, in order to be considered authentic, must be supported in turn by an iznad, or chain, of supposedly reliable witnesses. Many Muslims allow their attitude to everyday life to be determined by these anecdotes. Regarding dogs as unclean, for example, on the sole ground that Muhammad is said to have done so. My own favorite tale goes the other way. The Prophet is said to have cut off the long sleeve of his garment, rather than disturb a cat that was slumbering on it. Cats in Muslim lands have been generally spared the awful treatment visited on them by Christians, who have often regarded them as satanic familiars of witches. As one might expect, the six authorized collections of hadith, which pile hearsay upon hearsay through the unwinding of the long spool of his nads, A told B, who had it from C, who learned it from D, were put together centuries after the events they purport to describe. One of the most famous of the six compilers, Bukhari, died 238 years after the death of Muhammad. Bukhari is deemed unusually reliable and honest by Muslims, and seems to have deserved his reputation in that of the 300,000 attestations he accumulated in a lifetime devoted to the project, he ruled that 200,000 of them were entirely valueless and unsupported. Further exclusion of dubious traditions and questionable isnads reduced his grand total to 10,000 hadith. You are free to believe, if you so choose, that out of this formless mass of illiterate and half-remembered witnessing, the pious Bukhari, more than two centuries later, managed to select only the pure and undefiled ones that would bear examination. Some of these candidates for authenticity might have been easier to sift out than others. The Hungarian scholar Ignaz Goldzier, to quote a recent study by Reza Aslan, was among the first to show that many of the Hadith were no more than verses from the Torah and the Gospels, bits of rabbinic sayings, ancient Persian maxims, passages of Greek philosophy, Indian proverbs, and even an almost word-for-word -word reproduction of the Lord's Prayer. Great chunks of more or less straight biblical quotation can be found in the Hadith, including the parable of the workers hired at the last moment and the injunction, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, the last example meaning that this piece of pointless pseudo-profundity has a place in two sets of revealed scripture. 
Aslan notes that by the time of the ninth century, when Muslim legal scholars were attempting to formulate and codify Islamic law through the process known as ishtihad, they were obliged to separate many hadith into the following categories. Lies told for material gain and lies told for ideological advantage. Quite rightly, Islam effectively disowns the idea that it is a new faith, let alone a cancellation of the earlier ones, and it uses the prophecies of the Old Testament and the Gospels of the New like a perpetual crutch or fund to be leaned on or drawn upon. In return for this derivative modesty, all it asks is to be accepted as the absolute and final revelation. As might be expected, it contains many internal contradictions. It is often cited as saying that there is no compulsion in religion, and as making reassuring noises about those of other faiths being peoples of the book, or followers of an earlier revelation. The idea of being tolerated by a Muslim is as repulsive to me as the other condescensions, whereby Catholic and Protestant Christians agreed to tolerate one another or extend toleration to Jews. The Christian world was so awful in this respect and for so long that many Jews preferred to live under Ottoman rule and submit to special taxes and other such distinctions. However, the actual Quranic reference to Islam's benign tolerance is qualified because some of these same peoples and followers may be such of them as are bent on evil doing, and it takes only a short acquaintance with the Quran and the Hadith to discover other imperatives, such as the following. Nobody who dies and finds good from Allah in the hereafter would wish to come back to this world even if he were given the whole world and whatever is in it, except the martyr who, on seeing the superiority of martyrdom, would like to come back to the world and be killed again. Or, God will not forgive those who serve other gods beside him, but he will forgive whom he will for other sins. He that serves other gods besides God is guilty of a heinous sin. I chose the first of these two violent excerpts from a whole thesaurus of unsavory possible ones, because it so perfectly negates what Socrates is reported to have said in Plato's Apology, to which I am coming. And I chose the second because it is such a patent and abject borrowing from the Ten Commandments. The likelihood that any of this humanly derived rhetoric is inerrant, let alone final, is conclusively disproved, not just by its innumerable contradictions and incoherencies, but by the famous episode of the Quran's alleged satanic verses, out of which Salman Rushdie was later to make a literary project. On this much-discussed occasion, Muhammad was seeking to conciliate some leading Meccan polytheists, and in due course experienced a revelation that allowed them, after all, to continue worshipping some of the older local deities. It struck him later that this could not be right, and that he must have inadvertently been channeled by the devil, who for some reason had briefly chosen to relax his habit of combating monotheists on their own ground. Muhammad believed devoutly not just in the devil himself, but in minor desert devils or jinns as well. It was noticed even by some of his wives that the prophet was capable of having a revelation that happened to suit his short-term needs, and he was sometimes teased about it. We are further told, on no authority that need be believed, that when he experienced revelation in public, he would sometimes be gripped by pain and experience loud ringing in his ears. Beads of sweat would burst out on him even on the chilliest of days. Some heartless Christian critics have suggested that he was an epileptic, though they fail to notice the same symptoms in the seizure experienced by Paul on the road to Damascus. But there is no need for us to speculate in this way. It is enough to rephrase David Hume's unavoidable question. Which is more likely? that a man should be used as a transmitter by God to deliver some already existing revelations, or that he should utter some already existing revelations and believe himself to be, or claim to be, ordered by God to do so. As for the pains and the noises in the head or the sweat, one can only regret the seeming fact that direct communication with God is not an experience of calm, beauty, and lucidity. The physical existence of Muhammad, however poorly attested by the Hadith, is a source of both strength and weakness for Islam. It appears to put it squarely in the world and provides us with plausible physical descriptions of the man himself, but it also makes the whole story earthy, material, and gross. We may flinch a little at this mammal's betrothal to a nine-year-old girl, and at the keen interest he took in the pleasures of the dining table, and the division of the spoils after his many battles and numerous massacres. Above all, and here is a trap that Christianity has mostly avoided, by awarding its prophet a human body but a non-human nature, he was blessed with numerous descendants and thus placed his religious posterity in a position where it was hostage to his physical one. Nothing is more human and fallible than the dynastic or hereditary principle, 
and Islam has been racked from its birth by squabbles between princelings and pretenders, all claiming the relevant drop of original blood. If the total of those claiming descent from the founder was added up, it would probably exceed the number of holy nails and splinters that went to make up the thousand-foot cross on which, judging by the number of splinter-shaped relics, Jesus was evidently martyred. As with the lineage of the Isnads, a direct kinship line with the Prophet can be established if one happens to know and be able to pay the right local imam. In the same way, Muslims still make a certain obeisance to those same satanic verses and tread the pagan polytheistic path that was laid out long before their Prophet was born. Every year at the Hajj or annual pilgrimage, one can see them circling the cuboid Kaaba shrine in the center of Mecca, taking care to do so seven times, following the direction of the sun around the earth, as Karen Armstrong weirdly and no doubt multiculturally puts it, before kissing the black stone set in the Kaaba's wall. This probable meteorite, which no doubt impressed the yokels when it first fell to earth, the gods must be crazy, no, make that god must be crazy, is a stop on the way to other ancient pre-Islamic propitiations, during which pebbles must be hurled defiantly at a rock that represents the evil one. Animal sacrifices complete the picture. Like many but not all of Islam's principal sites, Mecca is close to unbelievers, which somewhat contradicts its claim to universality. It is often said that Islam differs from other monotheisms in not having had a reformation. This is both correct and incorrect. There are versions of Islam, most notably the Sufi, much detested by the devout, which are principally spiritual rather than literal and which have taken on some accretions from other faiths. And since Islam has avoided the mistake of having an absolute papacy, capable of uttering binding edicts, hence the proliferation of conflicting fatwas from conflicting authorities, its adherents cannot be told to cease believing what they once held as dogma. This might be to the good, but the fact remains that Islam's core claim, to be unimprovable and final, is at once absurd and unalterable. Its many warring and discrepant sects, from Ismaili to Ahmadi, all agree on this indissoluble claim. Reformation has meant, for Jews and Christians, a minimal willingness to reconsider Holy Writ as if it were, as Salman Rushdie so daringly proposed in his turn, something that can be subjected to literary and textual scrutiny. The number of possible Bibles is now admitted to be immense, and we know, for example, that the portentous Christian term Jehovah is a mistranslation of the unuttered spaces between the letters of the Hebrew Yahweh. Yet no comparable project has ever been undertaken in Quranic scholarship. No serious attempt has been made to catalogue the discrepancies between its various editions and manuscripts, and even the most tentative efforts to do so have been met with almost inquisitional rage. A critical case in point is the work of Christoph Luxemburg, the Syriac Aramaic version of the Quran, published in Berlin in the year 2000. Luxemburg coolly proposes that far from being a monoglot screed, the Quran is far better understood once it is conceded that many of its words are Syriac Aramaic rather than Arabic. His most celebrated example concerns the rewards of a martyr in paradise. When retranslated and redacted, the heavenly offering consists of sweet white raisins rather than virgins. This is the same language in the same region from which much of Judaism and Christianity emerged. There can be no doubt that unfettered research would result in the dispelling of much obscurantism. But at the very point when Islam ought to be joining its predecessors in subjecting itself to re-readings, there is a soft consensus among almost all the religious that because of the supposed duty of respect that we owe the faithful, this is the very time to allow Islam to assert its claims at their own face value. Once again, faith is helping to choke free inquiry and the emancipating consequences that it might bring.